Good evening, River of Life Church. Glad that you have tuned in to uh, spend some time together in God's Word tonight. And I've just got uh, an encouraging word. I, I want to continue to encourage you in your relationship with the Lord and specifically about prayer as Pastor Mike's been talking about prayer over the past few weeks. And so I want to tonight talk about really authoritative prayer or legislative prayer. That there's a, a dimension of prayer that we can enter into that's not just uh, prayers and petitions and requests. And certainly we are doing that not only for our personal lives and for our friends and people that we know, but we're also doing that in this season for our country and for an outpouring of God's spirit all over the globe. And God does want us to season our pray, praying with a legislative prayers, authoritative prayers. And so we are going to take a look at that tonight, and we're going to start off, I'm going to jump into Matthew chapter 28, and it says that uh, Jesus was given all authority in heaven and in earth. He was given all authority in heaven and in earth. So I guess the question that I have for you, if Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth, how much authority does the devil have? It's not a trick question because if Jesus has all of it, there's none left over for him, the devil, to operate in at that point in time. But what Jesus is calling us to do is to be a part of a legislative body to walk into the type of prayer that's authoritative, it's legislative, that we get to know his heart and his ways and the ways of the kingdom so that we can legislate kingdom decrees into the earth. And he does that by bestowing and giving that authority to us to be able to do that. Because any true authority, don't you know, is usually authority that's bestowed upon us by someone who is a superior to us. Now, certainly, sometimes God bypasses human agents altogether. It's kind of like an example of parental authority. When you have children and you are the parent, you've got authority over those children that you are to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And so that's an authority established by God in that situation. There's also an authority that comes from walking through different trials in life. For example, if you've had a fiery trial in your finances, say that you grew up in poverty, and eventually it was one of the areas that God really showed himself strong on your behalf. And the, the sin or the, I should say, the spirit of poverty was broken off of you so that you may now prosper in a kingdom way. Well, your breakthrough in that area just isn't a breakthrough for yourself. It's actually your breakthrough can manifest and mean so much more to many others so that you bring a breakthrough to them also. So God has given you an authority to go forth, to teach, to anoint, and to give wisdom to people so that they can break a spirit of poverty off of their lives and that they can operate in the kingdom abundance that God has. And so there's a, the authority there that you earn straight from God. And then, of course, we know authority in the natural realm, that we have employers, we have uh, bosses that may come to us, and they may say, hey, I'm giving you an assignment on a sp specific topic or an area. And then you've got authority in that arena to go ahead and to begin to operate to complete that assignment. And so we can see that we get authority directly from the Lord by the Spirit. And then we get authority that is still God-ordained, but it comes through human agents. 
And the authority that we're talking about tonight is really an authority that comes straight from the Lord. And since the enemy has no authority, he tries to come in and steal authority. And usually his best weapon to do this is called deception. Of course, many people in the world, unfortunately at this time, are in the clutches of the enemy. They don't know the saving grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And so there are many things that they're deceived about, and they can actually allow evil to operate through them. We don't have to look very, uh, very far or very hard to see some of the evil that's being perpetrated in the earth right now. But there is also a deception that the enemy uses against Christians, that they become deceived, that they line up with the lies of the enemy. And so then what we do is we actually hand our authority over to the enemy by believing the lie and by agreeing with him. But that's not what God is wanting for us. It's not what he has for us because he is wanting us to partner with his spirit, the spirit of truth, so that we can actually fashion and shape history, not just in our own personal lives, but in the lives of this nation and the lives of this world, that we can shape the course of history through nations because we have chosen to partner with the Lord. Because Jesus goes on to say this right after the, declaring that he has all authority. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. And that word nations there is really where we get our word ethnic. So it's all ethnic peoples. That's a really good word in this season. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So you are called now as one of these. You have been commissioned by the Lord to be a disciple maker to all ethnic peoples as you just go about in your regular day, that you are called to give something to strengthen another person in their walk with the Lord. And each and every one of us can do that because each and every one of us has been given the authority to do it by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 16, this is where we get a very familiar verse and it says this, and this is when Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus comes in right after that and commends Peter for his declaration that he really received this from the Father in heaven. And he said this to Peter. He said, I, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The ecclesia is the word there. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The key word that I want to just take a look at tonight in that uh, verse is the ecclesia. Now, that can be, it was used actually in, in the Greek secular term at that time as people who were called out of their city-states to come together to make legislative policy about things that are happening in their society. And so God has called us out of the world into his kingdom. And now when we gather with those in that spiritual kingdom, we are to come together to make legislative decrees. We are to come together and legislate or rule from heaven in that situation. So it's a legislative authority that gives us the power to permit some things to happen and then forbid other things. 
And we certainly can just take a glance at the news and see some things that are happening that should not be happening and other things that we know should be happening. And we can call upon the Lord of the whole earth and we can begin to see these things shift as we pray into the state of our nation. It's so very important right now, and I want to stress this to you, that the whole world, you may not know it, the whole world is looking at the United States of America right now to see what is going to happen. I believe that we're in a similar position as such as Great Britain when they were in World War II. And there was a man, the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who rose up and basically gave that country incredible courage and stamina in a very dark night. And because of that, World War II was completely changed. Hitler was defeated. If Hitler, Hitler hadn't been defeated, we would probably be looking at an incredibly different landscape today in the world. And I believe this, this is the United States of America's time, that it is a key time, that it is a hinge right now in the history of the world. And I believe because we are a praying people, that there are many prayer movements that are going on right now all across our nation, that God is hearing our prayer that he has heard our prayer. He continues to hear our prayers, according to 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and that he is going to heal the land. Now, that does that mean that we need to stop praying, that we can get in our hammock and chill out? No, we need to continue to persist because there is an outpouring of God's Spirit that he wants to bring and that is on his mind and on his heart, that there's an incredible harvest that he wants to bring, not only in the United States of America, but all across the world during this time frame. But our responsibility in this is that we continually have to be learning about the king, getting to know him, spending time with intimacy, in intimacy with him, and then getting into his word so that we may know his ways also. Because we just can't go nilly-willy and just decide, this is what I'm going to decree. I'm going to decree that uh, all of Congress shall be Democrats, and that's the way that we're going to go. No, it's not about my agenda. It's not about your agenda. It's about the Spirit's agenda for the kingdom of heaven. And so our responsibility is to get close to him, to learn his ways, to walk in righteousness and holiness so that we may decree and pray as a legislative body in the earth and that we get heaven into earth. That's our goal. It's not time to check out. It's not time to look at the rapture verses. It's not time for any of that. I want to encourage you that God knows exactly right where you are. You were born and you're alive in the earth right now because God said, I wanted you here during this time frame. You are born for such a time as this. And God wants to move through you he wants you to be an agent of the kingdom of heaven. With that familiar scripture that I used right there, I want to turn to Esther. And you may know the story of Esther very well, or you may need to refresh yourself on that. But we see Esther, she's an unknown, unknown Jewish girl growing up in the Persian kingdom there. And the, the king has gotten rid of Vashti because she didn't come in when he wanted her to come in. And so he begins to look for another queen. And eventually, through the preparation, that year of going through all the motions, Esther rises to become the queen. And she sits in that position for approximately five years. She's probably thinking as a young woman, what is this all about in this hour? Why am I here 
I don't even want to be here. I'd rather be with Mordecai and my family than being in the king's palace. But then there came a time and a season when she was needed. She was called upon because Haman, a wicked counselor of the king, wanted to overthrow and destroy all of the Jewish people because Mordecai, her cousin and the one who raised her, would not bow down to Haman. And so Esther has to risk her life by going in to see the king unannounced. But the scepter was extended to her, and she received favor in his sight, and eventually Haman's wicked scheme is found out, and then Esther proceeds to plead to the king about getting retribution in the situation. And the king allows Esther and Mordecai to come together and put out a decree that will allow the Jewish people on that day to go ahead and defend themselves and to take down their enemies. And there's just a couple scriptures that I just want to read to you out of this story that kind of just brings home the whole thing about making decrees. Remember, this, when making a decree, it's a little bit different from when you make a petition or request or you're making intercession. You know, 1 Peter calls us a royal priesthood. And those types of prayers that I just mentioned can be really on the priesthood side of that terminology there. But don't you know, there's also, we are a royal priesthood, that royalty is involved, that we array ourselves and we conduct ourselves and we think like royalty. We think like kings and queens that, as Ephesians says, we've been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. And so when we come with a kingly anointing of authority, we find out the heart of the king, and then we begin to decree, make decrees from heaven into earth, since we are seated in that heavenly realm. And we can see heaven begin to manifest all around us. So you are part of this royal priesthood. Now, getting back to the story of Esther and these couple of uh, scriptures that I just wanted to bring up, it says in Esther 8.8, 8, and this was the king saying this to Esther and to Mordecai. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one else can revoke. The king allowed Esther and Mordecai to write the decree. He gave them authority. He delegated it to them so that they can write the decree. But it was in his name and with his signet ring. Esther and Mordecai are a picture of the church. That as we know and get to know the Lord even further in deeper in intimacy with him, we then are able to decree his word and see changes made in the earth. It goes on to say in Esther chapter 9, verse 29, it says this, the, Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. They wrote with full authority. I think it's interesting, and, I, and I'm sure I'm probably right on this, is that when Esther became queen, do you think that the king allowed Esther to write a decree the first day that she stepped into the palace? I don't think so. No trust was there. She didn't know the ways of the kingdom. She didn't know the court uh, royalties and protocols. She was unfamiliar with all of that. But in the midst of five years of being the queen, she was being trained so that she could reign. And that's what God is wanting us to do. 
He's wanting us to learn him, to know him, to know his ways, to know his word, so that we can begin to reign as the people that he's called us to be. And this is for you. You don't have to be a superstar intercessor. You don't have to be some great prophetic person. All you have to do is be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, bear his name, abide in him, seek his face, seek his heart, and then you may decree his word into the earth also. Hallelujah. I love that. I wanted to give you just a, a small uh, example of how to do this. If you're thinking, wow, I've never done this before. This might feel a little bit odd to you. Um, I don't know if I can do this. I'm good with prayers. I'm good with petitions. I'm good with requests, that sort of thing. I'm good with thanksgiving. I'm good with praise. I'm good with worship. I just wanted to give you a little taste of how this works. Uh, and, and I just wanted to read a, a familiar scripture probably to you out of Isaiah chapter 54. And it comes down into verse 16 and 17. It says this, it says, Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. I'm bringing this up because one of the best and easiest ways to learn how to do decrees is to just to take a portion of Scripture and then sometimes you can turn that around and use it as just regular prayers and intercession, but also that you can learn how to begin to make decrees with that word. So in this situation, I'm sure that you may have already done this in some of your personal situations at home that you begin to pronounce, Lord, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up in judgment against me shall not happen. We can even take that and we can apply that to President Trump, to our other leaders in government. We can do it over our nation, that no weapon formed against the United States of America, whether internal foe or external foe, will prosper but tyranny will come down. Lawlessness and anarchy will come down. And we decree and declare that the peace of God will pervade the land in the name of Jesus. And you can do that with the Psalms. You can do that with different epistles. As you go through it, use the word as your uh, prayer template, so to speak. And then begin to make decrees and intercessions with that word. It's just a great way to start. I'll give a personal example. A few years ago, I was uh, driving my car and I was trying to accelerate quickly up this hill. And I, I did that. And then all of a sudden, I just, it's like I just lost power. Fortunately, I was in a position where I was able to get off to the side of the road real easily, had it uh, towed to my mechanic and the mechanic started to take a look at it and he, he could not find out what was wrong with it. it it baffled him for a few different days and I'm thinking oh great that's not really good because I don't want to spend all the extra money right now to go ahead and buy a new car I, I just want to get this one fixed so I can continue to use it and it would be um, more advantageous for me to do that so I'm praying over this uh, situation. And a familiar verse just kind of comes in real light to me that, and it was, if you would just believe, Chris, you will see the glory of God. And it was just like a, a, a phrase. And so I went and I looked that up and it comes out of John chapter 11 with Lazarus and Mary and Martha and, and that whole story. And so what I began to do is like, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. I don't know what's happening right now. But God, we are going to see your glory in this situation. And it's, it's fun because God's glory can be so very practical at times. 
And that's a good thing for all of us, that's for sure. And so I just continued to pronounce that, would check back with, uh, with my mechanic. And eventually, uh, probably about four or five days later, he goes, we, we found out what it was. Hey, this is what we're going to do. Uh, it's only going to be about $500. So I actually got to see answer to prayer there concerning my car just because I continued to believe God in the midst of circumstances that were contrary to what I was believing. But truly, it was one of those things that had baffled the experts for a while, but then they were able to pinpoint it. God had given the, the clue of what it was, and then I was able to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, and that's a good thing. And that's not only for me, that's certainly for you also. I'd just love to pray for you tonight as you continue your journey here in 2020. I think God has incredible things in store for us. We are on the cusp of an incredible outpouring of glory like we have never experienced before in the earth, certainly not in our lifetime anyway. And you get to be a part of it. So my encouragement to you is don't listen to the news, turn off the news because it's a slant. Uh, they're going to spin it. They're going to do what they want to do. And it's only going to bring you down in the process. Tune in to WHVN. Some of you will get that. Tune in to WHVN. That's short for heaven. Get into that frequency and listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying Listen to the scriptures that he's leading you into. And let's declare the glory of God into the earth like a mighty rushing river. Because it says that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters covers the seas. So Lord, tonight I pray for your people, O oh God. I pray, Father, for a Holy Spirit boldness to be upon them in the prayer closet. That, God, that they would not back away or back down or even be sheepish. Lord, I believe that you are mantling your people in this season with an incredible spirit of the lion of the tribe of Judah. That, Father, you're wanting to release a roar through them in the prayer closet. And I pray, Father, that they wouldn't grow weary, that they wouldn't grow uh, tired, that they wouldn't be bored. But God, I pray, Father, for new strength upon them. I pray that there would be just a, an excitement to get into the prayer closet, to see the delight of it, Lord, that it's not a duty, it's not a discipline only, but Lord, it is a delight. And that, Father, that you will pour out your spirit upon them in the prayer closet and they would be majorly effective. God, I just want to thank you tonight that you're hearing our prayer, that our prayers, Father, I thank you, are moving your heart, and you see where we are because the problems are way bigger than any of us. And so, Lord, we thank you for your incredible mercy, for your incredible grace, for loving us, and, Lord, we decree together that the United States of America shall be saved and we will see the greatest outpouring in the history of the world. And we thank you for it and give you glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed.